Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you. And uh, first of all, apologies for not being live at this moment, simply because I am traveling. I'm recording this literally a couple of hours before the uh, before the event. So what uh, um, what uh, uh, Shoba asked me to do, and I thank her for that for that is to uh, speak in the context of this uh, uh, very i would say very timely uh, webinar uh, to speak about as you see there the way forward what needs to change to keep the promise and uh, let me tell you that i will not just speak of uh, tbhiv or the association between tb and hiv but i will speak about tuberculosis in general uh, and and before before I begin, uh, I think it's correct to just look at the uh, current situation for tuberculosis. This is the global burden of TB, the latest estimates by the World Health Organization. Uh, organization. And what you can see there is that uh, there are uh, today more than 10 million cases estimated to occur every year, with 1.3 million that are uh, estimated to die because of tuberculosis. That's a huge number. We are talking about thousands and thousands every day. Uh, you see also the row that uh, corresponds to the HIV associated TB, where um, I would say, fortunately, 6.3% uh, uh, only of the 10.6 million people are people living with HIV, uh, but they are there and uh, they constitute uh, still uh, today a, a major tragedy uh, of the AIDS epidemic, a consequence of the AIDS epidemic. And as you can see there, 167,000 are estimated to, uh, to die because of tuberculosis when they have HIV infection. So that is literally a, a big, big burden. And once you see this slide, you can immediately understand where the burden is uh, uh, particularly uh, heavy. And that is in the African continent. You see the rates per 100,000 here in the African continent, in Southeast Asia, in India, in, uh, in Mongolia, actually, in uh, Indonesia, etc. And once you start putting these rates per capita into absolute numbers, you find what uh, is illustrated in the pie there. So that m nearly half of the of the uh, people that uh, uh, have tuberculosis emerge in Southeast Asia and uh, another 18 percent in the Western Pacific region with uh, uh, 23 percent in the African continent. The rest is distributed, as you see uh, over there now. This is a, a huge burden. And uh, if I look at the TBHIV Association, that's the kind of map that WHO has produced uh, uh, six months ago, the latest one. So what you can see here is very uh, uh, clear is the prevalence of HIV infection in people with tuberculosis. Uh, and that means how many are seropositive, right? HIV seropositive uh, among people with TB. And, and, and that is what you find. You find, first of all, that uh, uh, those uh, uh, nearly 700,000 new cases in 2022 are particularly uh, affecting the African continent, where uh, the estimate is that about three quarters of these cases are in fact in Africa, but uh, and with particular, uh, I would say, peaks in southern Africa in that area. So in South Africa, Lesotho, Swaziland and so on. Uh, but uh, that doesn't doesn't in a way spare another part of the world that is particularly affected, and that is the uh, former Soviet countries, if I still want to use this terminology. In essence, Russia Ukraine and some other Central Asian area. area. Uh, now, um, international targets have been set in the context of tuberculosis, and they have been set in uh, in a variety of different forms. So, um, the, the the international targets that we have today uh, are still those of the NTB strategy, which was approved by the World Health Assembly exactly ten years ago. Uh, and I will go through them. And then you have the uh, same type of uh, philosophy of targets in the Sustainable Development Goals framework, but then the high level meetings came. One was in 2018, the second one was just six months ago or so in uh, in uh, September, actually, of 2023 at the UN General Assembly, where new targets were uh, uh, proposed. These are the uh, targets, uh, um, I would say the official targets of the Sustainable Development Goals that simply speaks about ending the epidemic of tuberculosis, uh, as well as that of AIDS, AIDS, malaria and so on, as you can see there. Um, 
in the cost, in context of the end TB strategy that uh, we, uh, as WHO, when I was at WHO, that we uh, uh, took to the World Health Assembly for approval, you can see the other target that were set: an 80% reduction of TB incidence by 2030, a 90% reduction in the number of deaths by 2030, and importantly, no household that uh, affected by TB that should suffer what we call catastrophic cost due to tuberculosis. That is uh, more than 20% of your income that is lost because of the disease. Where are we in terms of targets? We are far away. That's the point. We are really off track. This is the incidence. So what you can see is that the incidence was coming down, uh, incidence rate, I must uh, be precise, was coming down very slowly at about 1.5 to 2% per year until COVID. When COVID came, then the incidence started going up, linked to, uh, it is at least uh, estimated, linked to the uh, disruption of services, simply like that. And uh, the same happened with the number of deaths that you can see on the right here, coming down a bit more uh, quickly, like about 3%, major success in a way in the TB uh, epidemic story. And then again, in 2020, we have this increase. So the um, decline of both incidence and number of that that was promising, although slow, right, was completely interrupted in the COVID era. And we are still recovering now. Uh, we don't know yet if the incidence is, keeps growing. We will see in the next few months for 2023, while we know that that have resumed a decline. But that essentially means uh, losing, as you can see here, you know, losing uh, a number of people due to tuberculosis in this period of time and losing also uh, two, three years of decline. Uh, and this is the overall picture about all the targets. So on top left here, you see the NTB strategy targets, the, the ones I just mentioned, far away from the targets themselves, off track, as you can see. Even the one on the percentage of people that uh, are facing catastrophic expenditure remains at about 50%, 49% to be precise. It means that half of the families and the households affected by TB actually get impoverished because of the disease. And here you have the 2018, uh, the rest is all, the 2018 UN General Assembly targets. And, and what you can see there is that not one single target has been achieved with one exception. And that is the good news, the only good news I would say in this, which is the that people living with HIV have been administered, have been offered and administered prophylaxis, preventive treatment for tuberculosis. And that exceeds and far exceeds, as a matter of fact, the target that was established in 2018. So these five-year targets uh, by 2022 have been not reached, essentially. That's the point here, with one exception, as I mentioned. Okay, um, so where are we in general once we examine the situation in this uh, in this way? Well, the TB burden is extremely high. TB is remains the top infectious killer now that the COVID uh, the COVID pandemic is essentially uh, um, is essentially reducing dramatically. Fortunately, uh, its burden. COVID nineteen had a major impact on the incidence and death uh, trends, as I showed you. Uh, the global targets part of the NTB strategy are simply not on track, they are off track by far. The UN General Assembly targets established in 2018 for 2022 essentially were not reached with one exception. The, the only good news really is the preventive treatment among people living with HIV. HIV associated TB remains a challenge, although is in a declining mode, and this is good, and this is largely thanks also to the progress in the antiretroviral uh, availability. And finally, multidrug resistant TB, I did not speak about it, but is stable globally, and that has to be clear, is stable globally, it's around, it, it, it goes around three to four uh, percent of all cases, but it represents a major burden up to even one third of cases in some parts of the world. That's a picture. Now, uh, this is, uh, uh, this is, I think, uh, essentially undisputable. So the question is really what is holding us back? And I have been showing this slide for a number of years now, and the bottlenecks to NTB are fundamentally two, financial and political. And the two, of course, are closely related. Let's start with the bottleneck of financial inadequacies. These are the data from the WHO Global Report that show to you that out of the expected at the time $13 billion to be available in 2022, 
effectively 5.8 billion were uh, the uh, were de facto available, which leaves a gap of more than seven billion dollars. We are running of uh, at less than half of what the need is. If we look at research, the same report of WHO shows essentially taken from the treatment action group shows uh, essentially this kind of picture. Essentially, half of the two billion. Uh, which is a very modest uh, uh, request, actually, out of the two billion uh, part of the uh, plan of the Stop TB partnership plan, out of these two billion, only one billion is available, leaving a gap, therefore, of more than a billion. That is the kind of situation in uh, economic terms and uh, in financial, I should say, terms. And uh, here is the new global plan to NTB that finally became more ambitious. And what you can see here, the targets by 2030 in terms of uh, uh, financing available will go to, in, to something that is in the area of nearly $20 billion per year. So the ambitions have grown. And the same is for research, $5 billion. I mean, I always uh, actually contested the $2 billion of the previous plan because that is fairly a fairly small amount once you compare it, for example, of what has been made available for HIV AIDS or even recently what has been made available, which has not yet been estimated precisely for COVID, or whatever has been made available for other diseases that have, a, a, after all, an impact on society that is inferior to that of uh, uh, tuberculosis. So now we are going to 5 billion. I do believe that if we had 5 billion, we could actually progress in a, in a, in a much uh, quicker way. Uh, although my claim is that we should actually approach the 10, 15 billion dollars per year that in principle are spent for other diseases that have an impact on society that is inferior to that of TB. And what is this uh, 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 the result of? Why do we have this situation? We described that back in 2010 in the Lancet here, as you see. Uh, and we uh, spoke uh, of what uh, is precisely in this particular paragraph. So what is holding us back, essentially? Why, why do we speak about political indifference? Well, uh, it's very clearly expressed there. Funding for tuberculosis is not sufficient, is neglected, we were saying at the time, we had, we had much less money at the time than we have today. Nevertheless, we think it's insufficient because this is not a special program of the World Bank, has never been, is not a name priority among any UN agency leaders. OK, including the World Health Organization, does not have a special United Nations program. It is not like, for example, AIDS, right? It is not in UNICEF portfolio, has never been visible in UNICEF portfolio, although it kills mothers, children. It's not a special presidential initiative in the USA. We have had a major presidential initiative on AIDS, even on malaria, on TB. Never. And does not have a strong support from the pharma industry that is crucial when we, we think about the development of new, uh, of new tools compared to other diseases, which we listed there back in 2010. And I would say that uh, one of the testimony of what I'm saying is that it was not even in the formal title of MDG6 of the Millennium Development Goal number six, which spoke only of combating HIV, malaria and other diseases when tuberculosis was actually one of the indicators with malaria and HIV, but they didn't even name it at that level. So 20 years ago, the situation was much worse, 24 years ago, much worse than it is today. At least this, uh, the, the, the fight against tuberculosis is visible and is now a, a recognized priority. I spoke um, about all of this, of the difficulties on uh, um, about having tuberculosis much more visible in the agenda, much more politically charged in an article published back now five years ago, where I said no accountability, no results. And uh, I explained why it is difficult to advocate for tuberculosis solutions. We don't enjoy communities that are visible, that are uh, uh, outspoken, you know, in uh, in the media, in uh, the television, in the radios, and every single day put pressure on politicians. We just don't enjoy that. There are attempts, obviously, and they are laudable attempts by uh, many community organizations to make tuberculosis more visible, but we are not yet at the level we should be for a disease that is the number one killer. That is the point here, and that's what I expressed in this article. So um, what should we do? 
Well, uh, I think we should go back to uh, history now in the last few years, uh, when I was still actually at the World Health Organization, we organized this uh, conference, the ministerial conference in Moscow. Um, we came up with uh, certain priorities, the top outcome areas of this uh, uh, of this uh, 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 event. And you can see there, one is advancing the response, obviously, so that is the response to tuberculosis. The second one is ensuring sustainable financing. And the third one was uh, increase, increment, intensify uh, uh, research. However, if I have to say what was the most important outcome of that conference was the recognition that we need to develop we needed at the time to develop a multi-sectoral accountability framework. Tuberculosis is um, is probably the best example of a, uh, uh, of a of a of a social disease, a disease that depends really on the uh, the the, the uh, societal weaknesses of the problems. It affects the marginalized, the poorest people. Um, we cannot just face tuberculosis with in mind that we will develop the new fantastic magic tools. That's not sufficient. It's essential, but it's not sufficient. We have to act at different level uh, levels of the uh, society. Uh, that kind of philosophy was then used for the UN high-level meeting uh, in 2018, the very first one that was in a way prepared through the Moscow conference. And this was the declaration. Declaration came up with new targets the ones I mentioned before, and then with a number of different uh, initiatives, activities, improving policies and systems, enabling multi-sectoral collaboration, the important one, if you like, uh, promoting an end to stigma, advancing research, etc., etc. Was it successful? That is the real question. Was this big effort, unprecedented effort, to raise tuberculosis at the level of uh, major other uh, uh, scourges of humanity, right, including HIV AIDS, including antimicrobial resistance, which had their own space at the UN General Assembly before tuberculosis. Well, uh, not for reason. if I look at what, uh, for example, the Lancet editorial said, you can see there, right, uh, United Nations and tuberculosis, a missed chance. UN high level meeting to NTB, disappointing. That was the kind of sentiment at the time, because um, um, there were some new initiatives, but not enough. We are far from having had, I would say, what was in the mind of those people who organized and planned to have tuberculosis at uh, the highest possible political level. Now, there was another event like this, obviously, the second high level meeting on TB on 22nd of September of 2023, so nearly eight more so months ago. And this is what the major commitments are. So again, a new set of targets, even perhaps more ambitious. As you can see, they are 90 percent uh, TB treatment coverage, right? Um, coverage of preventive treatment, 90 percent by 2027, which is only three years away. Coverage of rapid diagnostic tests of 100%. Coverage of social benefit and social protection, 100%. This, is, by the way, is a fundamental, it's a fundamental aim, that of social protection. Universal health coverage, which is the big mantra nowadays, is not sufficient for tuberculosis. We have demonstrated that still at my time, and more and more nowadays with cost surveys, that people, people that become poorer because of tuberculosis, actually become poorer mainly because of lack of social protection, which means that they uh, are not, in a way, um, their situation is not buffered by, uh, for example, additional money, uh, nutrition, and so on, that are part of social protection packages in countries that have them. And once you have, you have tuberculosis and you are obliged to stay at home for months and you lose your little income, then of course you become, po uh, you become poorer the next day. So without social protection, we are going to go nowhere. I think we are fooling ourselves if we believe that without universal health coverage everywhere and without social protection, we will ever get rid of this disease. So here are all the uh, sort of commitments. If I can summarize at this point of my, of my uh, in a way, provocative speech, well, in essence, TB reached an unprecedented political visibility. That is no question. But it is obviously not sufficient. So what should we do? I listed a few things that come to my mind, that came to my mind yesterday night when I was preparing this. Keep pursuing commitment by governments, governments at all levels, and I will go back to this, and make governments accountable to their citizens about a disease like this and as part 
of a package, if you like, of diseases that need attention by politicians and need adequate financing from, notice this, domestic, I put it in bold, domestic sources, because most countries affected by TB nowadays are middle income countries. And they cannot depend just on external money. So we need really to push governments to allocate their own domestic fundings. If we don't do that at national level, there is no international uh, meeting like this one that can actually uh, 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 buffer or arrange in such a way that this will happen. It's really activism, really activism that has to be uh, developed within each country. And again, uh, as needed, external sources. So there are the poorest countries in the world that will never be able to mobilize the necessary domestic resources in the next few years. So that is where the focus on external, external sources should be. Um, pursue a whole of government and whole of society approach. So these words that sound sometimes uh, fiction words, in reality, are the ones that we need for tuberculosis. This is a whole of government issue here. Tuberculosis depends on so many determinants, on so many other uh, factors that if these other sectors like poverty alleviation, like nutrition, like, uh, I don't know what, uh, uh, um, 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 air pollution, etc., which are all favoring tuberculosis, if these other sectors don't reach their own targets, then we will not have a solution to tuberculosis. And we need to develop creatively new forms of activism what we have today is not uh, is not sufficient everywhere in many countries it is not simply uh, it is not simply there so the community engagement remains uh, remains fundamental to maintain political pressure to argue in such a way that politicians that are at the government can actually do what they need to do uh, we need to also put all of this in alignment we need to align it with sustainable development and with the sdg philosophy. It's a multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral approach that we actually need. And of course, at the end of all, is build this multi-sectoral accountability that they have been talking about and monitor rigorously what uh, uh, everyone does and not just what, for example, the, the, the Minister of Health does or internationally what the World Health Organization does, but everyone is responsible because there are so many sectors that are determinants of tuberculosis and they need to know that if they improve they they if they improve they reach their own targets for example in poverty alleviation with social protection 100% for example in sdg 11 on the metropolitan areas to provide proper housing to people if they reach their own targets then the benefits will be for tuberculosis as well as for a bunch of other diseases linked to poverty that kind of mindset has to be developed we wrote about this uh, also very recently. This is an article published uh, in March together with uh, colleagues in the Southeast Asia region, as you see on top right there. We, we said more is needed to end TB. Uh, we commented in a way on the United Nations High Level Meeting on TB and said what is underlined there, establishing high level multi-sectoral bodies that report to the head of state is fundamental. This, in a way, we have to learn from the AIDS community. We have to learn from the COVID lessons. We have to learn from some other, malaria itself in Africa, for example, some other uh, uh, interventions that, uh, that uh, um, were uh, really fundamental in raising at the highest political level the issue at stake. We need to do exactly the same for TB, but that can only be done if we develop committees, we develop commissions, you can call it the way you like, but you know, uh, bodies that can uh, respond to directly to the head of state and therefore include the highest authorities in different sectors where there is need for action. We cannot just do it for TB all the time, just only for TB, we will not go far, we will be called verticalist. In reality, we have to do it in alignment, country by country, depending on the situation, with other priorities in health, and in social affairs in such a way that then we can build that kind of uh, uh, force that will eventually push governments to act in different sectors. And I think this is a fundamental uh, uh, principle that we need really to pursue. If we mobilize parliamentarians, these parliamentarians 
have to be given the tools in such a way that then can uh, push for the development, for example, of these, as I said, high level multi-sectoral bodies, commissions that report directly to the head of state. This is what happened in Africa in the response to HIV AIDS many years ago. And we see that the uh, results of that kind of intervention are uh, effectively very, uh, uh, very uh, prominent. So. I've been speaking about politics here and what needs to be done in political terms, but what about our strategy? Let's let's speak more about strategic approaches of more, in a way, even technical nature. Well, let's recognize, first of all, that the NTP strategy was uh, approved by the World Health Assembly, as you can see in this document, on 21st May 2014. So we are talking about just a bit more than 10 years ago. It was developed between 2012 in 2014. So it was developed starting uh, 12 years ago. So are we doing the right thing, right? It was then named NTV strategy, of course, and this is the strategy that you all know. Are we doing the right thing? Is this sufficient? We have these three pillars, one devoted to the care of people, one devoted to the systems and the policies, and the third devoted to innovation and research, based on four principles that you can see listed there. Government stewardship, in engagement of societies, uh, protecting human rights, ethics, and equity, and adapting the strategy. And we have all the targets that we have been discussing. Right. What is my meditation on that? Is the NTB strategy therefore delivering the expected result? No, it's not delivering. It's simply not delivering at the moment. And the question is, why not? Is it wrong? My uh, my guess, my uh, I would say my reading is the strategy itself embraces essentially all possible strategic approaches that we have available today. It was built 10 years ago, as I mentioned, where we did not at the time where we did not have all the molecular testing that we have nowadays. We did not have good regimens even for multidrug resistant TB that we have today. Uh, we did not have a vaccine. We still don't have a vaccine, but there is a promising one, uh, at least uh, in the pipeline. But it is the intensity, the implementation, the in a way, universality of NTB that are not sufficiently pursued in any country. Uh, and we know the reasons. It's a political issue. It's a financial issue. So the question is really what to do next. Well, uh, first, we need, I believe, we need to recognize that reaching any target in the case of tuberculosis requires the full involvement of the health sector. National programs must do what they need to do, embark, for example, on uh, um, on a full uh, universal access to new diagnostics, to new treatment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, uh, uh, and having health systems that are conducive to this. But also, we need a multi-sectoral engagement as tuberculosis, once again, uh, has deeply rooted determinants that cannot be targeted only through the health sector. So having the illusion that by improving national program activity will put an end to TB, I think uh, it's wrong. Uh, a national program have the responsibility to care of people, uh, to care for people, to actually uh, prevent that, but they cannot do, do it all. They need, they need other societal improvements that will create a situation where transmission is reduced, where there is no more uh, factor that uh, <clears throat> in a way allows reactivation or activation of a, of a, of a, of a latent infection into a, a disease. We need that, and that has to be done outside of the health sector. And second, we need, as I mentioned already, to mobilize the highest political authorities in each country, in every part of the world, to ensure what I've been calling a whole of government response to tuberculosis. So that I think is a fundamental type of work. This has been well understood, particularly in two regions of WHO, the Western Pacific and the Southeast Asia region. The Western Pacific region has a new framework, and I had the fortune of chairing the, uh, the, 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 the committee, the advisory committees that eventually develop this kind of document. This is the regional framework in the Western Pacific. You can see that they recognize there that we must, in, uh, must pursue TB specific interventions okay, which are the essential national program functions. Within the health sector, we need to pursue uh, the foundation of the health system that are conducive to good TB care and control and elimination, if we want to use these terms. So it's really policies that have to be TB sensitive. But also there is in green there, the layer that we can call beyond health, health beyond health, reaching health beyond health, improving the condition of people, the housing, the nutrition, and so on and so forth. 
So this is clearly recognized in the Western Pacific. It is equally clearly recognized in the Southeast Asia region, where uh, the uh, new uh, regional strategic plan speaks the same language. As you can see here, we have activities to be done, priority activities that we all understand within TB programs. We have other activities that we all understand within the health sector, responsibility of the ministers of health and not just of the national programs. But then we have to go beyond. And to go beyond, whose responsibility is that? is responsibility of those at the highest level. That's why we need to convince them and we need to create these commissions that in the end, in the end, will be putting enough pressure uh, <clears throat> at the level, at the highest level, at the head of state level, at the minister of finance level, so that allocation of resources can, can go. It sounds like a dream, but there are many people who think the same way, right? I can remember John Lennon's famous song, right? Uh, you think I am, I am, I'm silly to, 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 to think this way, but in reality, there are many people that think that way. And we know that it may happen because the HIV AIDS, for example, is a good lesson. And in more uh, concrete terms, is the global NTB strategy uh, still adequate or we need to rethink or think about it or revisit it? 12 years after we started thinking about the NTB strategy. And my latest uh, kind of uh, uh, thinking is this, is that uh, if uh, we have the strategy as it is, we don't need to change those pillars, those principles, they're still very valid, but we need to make it more visible at certain level. And I would just call it at the NTB version 2.0, where we add a fourth visible pillar that speaks about the multi-sectoral contributions in a very concrete way. Some of this was included in pillar two, in this pillar of policies. If you look at that, there were four elements there. The fourth element was speaking about multi-sectoriality and therefore the need of uh, that kind of approach. I think we need to extract that element and make it a proper pillar with very concrete type of recommendations that national program themselves could contribute to, but particular ministers and those who are at the highest level fight poverty, uh, fight for better nutrition, uh, 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 find the solution for the slums and the uh, settings where tuberculosis transmission is rampant, right? Give better conditions to workers, think about the miners and so on, make prisons reasonable and human in such a way that there is no more transmission there, etc. All of this in, in, involve different sectors of society and of activities. And I believe this is the way to go in the future. So uh, frankly, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if I had the possibility to do it, I would just add at this point a real fourth pillar very, quick, very uh, uh, directly addresses these issues. And with that, I thank you all for giving me this space, and I hope that uh, that uh, we all together can uh, can do more uh, for this disease because we are not there; we are off track, and we need action. And thank you so much for listening. <laughs>